Lord. Father, we thank you again for the freedom we have to come here this morning. As the ushers come forward, we're thankful for how you provided for us for another week. And we ask that this offering would go forth for your work to glorify you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Kids, if you want to come up to the front and keep me company, you can. I'm feeling a little bit lonely up here all, all by myself. But if you, you know, if you don't want to, that's all right. You can stay there. Oh, thank you. All right. Come on over. Well, we finally had some snow, as Mr. Jill already said. How many of you have taken advantage of the snow and done some outdoor, oh, good. There's even some adults. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Some outdoor activities. What about, okay, ice skating, anyone? Tobogganing? Ah, good. All right. All right. Skiing. Has anyone gone skiing? No. Okay. Tobogganing for the win at Glenridge Bible Church. That's what we've done. All right. Very good. What? What did it? Sh oh. <laughs> Shoveling. <laughs> Forgot about that. Scraping off the car. All those fun things. Oh, yeah. Well, we did do a little bit of tobogganing on Friday. And so I just wanted to know, if you're going to go tobogganing and you're going to have a good experience, what is something that you need to do? Or what, you know, I don't know. What do you need to do, Maddie? 
Okay, you need to have snow. This has always hindered us in the past. What else? You need to be warm. You know, the boots and the mittens and the snow pants and the hats, all the things. You need all the things. Okay, what else do you need if you're going to have a good time tobogganing? Yes? You need sleds. Yes. Yes. I know some of you have done things besides go tobogganing on sleds, but sleds are a good thing. What else, Benjamin? A big hill. You need a big hill. Let's talk about the hill for just a minute. On the hill, what are you looking for? What makes a good tobogganing hill? What? Snow. Okay, snow. And I heard somebody else say it. No trees. And along that same vein, what else do we want none of? Rocks. No trees. No rocks, because that does not make a good tobogganing hill. Now, just a second. Suppose, I know you would never do this, but suppose it's a wonderful snowy day, and you say, Mom, Dad, I'm going tobogganing. And you go outside in your shorts and your T-shirt, and you grab your mom's, like, best soup pot, and you go over to the hill in the forest with all the trees and the roots and the rocks. And you're like, yeah, here we go. What will mom or dad say to you or do to you? What do you suppose is going to happen to you? Yes. You're going to get hurt, if not by the rocks and trees, by mom and dad. They will not be pleased. No, because they want you to be safe and not foolish. And what I just described to you is very foolish, is it not? That would be a foolish thing to do. You see, in order to really have fun with tobogganing and to enjoy it and to be safe, you need to understand the nature of your body, how your body works. And you also need to understand the nature of tobogganing. You know, the idea of things pick up speed when they go downhill and that Rocks are hard, and so are trees. You need to understand these things. And if you don't understand those things, you need to go tobogganing with somebody who does understand and will tell you. Right? That's really important. Otherwise, you'll run into trouble, literally. And you could be really hurt or worse. And it's the same kind of thing when we think about Moses in the Old Testament, because we know this story from Disciple Land, when he had led God's people out of Egypt, and now they're in the, in the desert, and they come to Mount Sinai. Sometimes it's called the mountain of God or the mountain of holiness. And God is there, and he wants to meet with his people. But he tells Moses, he says, Moses, don't let the people touch the mountain. The people need to stay away from the mountain. And not just the people, the animals too. Remember we talked about that? We talked about don't go over to the mountain because God in his holiness is going to be there. And God said, God, Moses, I will speak to you and you give the message to the people. Keep the people away. Don't let them get close to the mountain or they will die. Because the people needed to understand the nature of God. That he is holy. And because of God's holiness, anything unholy just could not come close or they would die. And so it was really important that they understood that. And, and God used Moses to help teach them that. And we can learn what God is like by looking at those stories in the Bible that tell us what God is like. Because I don't know that we think about that. It would be really hard to describe tobogganing to somebody who lived in, I don't know, a rainforest they might not understand what tobogganing really is. They wouldn't understand what snow is like and going down a hill fast in a place where there's no trees. And it's kind of like that with us. It's hard for us to understand what in the world it means by the holiness of God. But the Bible is there to help us understand a little bit so that we can fully appreciate, well, who we are in comparison with who God is. So we approach God in the right way as his people learned that they must do as well. So that's what Pastor Bobby's going to be talking about this morning, a little bit anyways, that story of when God came and he, he ended up giving the Ten Commandments to his people because they were going to start a brand new nation, and he met with them. Let's pray now. Father, we sang this morning about your holiness, and it's hard for us 
to understand what that even means. Because we live in a world where we've become used to unholiness. That's just normal for our brains. We can't hardly even understand what it means for you to be a holy God. And yet there are pictures in the Bible, we read about them in your word, that gives us an idea of what what that is and what you are like. And we know that by your Holy Spirit, you can reveal to us the things you want us to understand in a more clear way. So would you help us to have a very much better understanding of who we are and who you are? And would you help us to be in awe of the fact that in spite of our unholiness, you love us and you've called us to be your children and that we can hide ourselves in you and be, in a sense, protected by you and surrounded by your love and your holiness. And we can be safe in your goodness. And we thank you for this. It's a mystery that we don't fully understand, but help us to get a little bit of a better glimpse this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, if you're joining me in Disciple Land, I'll see you back there. Well, good morning. It just shows you the wisdom of Angela when she mentions you look for hills with no trees. Uh, We look for hills with trees and rocks, cars, parking lot. We always look for obstacles. Then again, that might explain the why, why I am the way I am, I guess, hitting too many trees tobogganing over the years. Um, I hope you've had a good week. Uh, we are going to continue our study in the Torah, and we are coming to what's been referred to as the Holy Mount, and Angela mentioned that. It is also Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. And if you're able to, we're in Genesis chapter 19. If you're able to, please stand for the public reading of God's word. Let's get right into the text this morning. We're in Exodus 19, verses 1 to 17. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they had set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And so Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for all the people around, saying, beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. And so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Our loving Father, we come to the text this morning. I pray with a divine awe at the presence of God. This what we call a theophany. A physical manifestation of the person and holiness of God upon your mountain so many years ago. The awe of that holiness. The wonder. The fear. The trembling of your people as they are at the foot of the mountain as your presence descended upon it. 
May we too also have that reverence of spirit, reverence of heart and mind as we come to this text, this holy ground, to remember, to learn from, and to apply the principles, the timeless principles of your word to our own individual lives and the life of the church. We pray this all for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. One of the amazing things about the Bible is its, pros- its, its habit, if you will, its propensity to bring stories full circle. You take, for example, the life of Joseph, who we studied not so long ago. Sold off by his brothers, unawares, they then come to him as their means of salvation from a devastating drought. The once despised and rejected younger son of Jacob is now the savior of his family and a ruler in Egypt. His life full circle. David is in an encounter with the priest Ahimelech in the city of Nob in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21. He's on the run from Saul. The Lord Jesus would commend the actions of Ahimelech the priest when he gives David and his men some of the consecrated bread. But I'm always drawn to the sword David takes, the sword of Goliath. And in a way, his life comes full circle. While David is on the run, he's reminded of the great victories of the Lord secured through him when he defeated Goliath in the battle of Sukkah in the valley of Elah. Another story, Queen Esther. Descended from King Saul, the same king, Saul, who failed to destroy the Amalekites totally. And although David would destroy most of the Amalekites, a small remnant survived, a thorn in Israel's side throughout their history. And by the time of the Persian rule, We are reintroduced to a descendant of King Agag, king of the Amalekites. You remember him, Haman, a man bent on the genocidal extermination of the Jews. It would be Queen Esther who would intervene, save her people instead of the Jews being wiped out. Haman, the descendant of King Agag, the one who should have been executed by Saul, is instead destroyed by one of his kingly descendants, Queen Esther. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who life, his perfect life, comes full circle, who, coming from glory, would return to that glory after the work of his first advent was fulfilled, the giving of his life as a payment for our sin. Verses 1 to 3 describe for us what will become a pivotal, defining, narrative moment for the children of Israel and in the personal life of Moses himself. In a real sense, Moses has returned to where it all began. And along with him, we witness the faithfulness of the Lord in fulfilling his word, the word he spoke to Moses on that very mountain, way back in chapter 3 and verse 12. And he said, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And here we are, full circle. Ten plagues, doubts, challenges to God's authority, a battle with the Amalekites, the introduction of Joshua, and here Moses is back at the foot of Mount Horeb, or as I said, as is probably better known as Mount Sinai, God's holy mountain. It probably explains why after the children of Israel arrived and begin setting up their camp, Moses is seen almost immediately ascending the mountain. It reminds us when we go camping or when we go to the beach as a family. We arrive at our campsite, we begin unpacking, And as I am setting up the tent looking for my children to lend me some assistance, they're already at the beach in the water, and they've been there for an hour. Well, much in the same way, the children of Israel, as they are setting up their tents, it's as though Moses just leaves them in some sort of fevered excitement to return to the mountain. Well, we've been here before. He's been here before, Moses, that is. It was here on this mountain that he had his first supernatural encounter with the living God. When he turned aside to see a bush that was on fire but wasn't being consumed. Where he was commissioned as God's instrument of deliverance for his people, the people whose cries this God had heard. Where God promised he would return Moses and his people, the children of Israel. And by being here now, God has proven himself faithful and true and has validated Moses' leadership. Moses has returned to Mount Sinai changed. He has grown. He has matured. After everything he's experienced, everything he's learned, after everything he has witnessed, he finally returns to Horeb, to Sinai, truly as God's spokesperson, as the intermediary between God and his people. 
There are often times in our own lives where we need to have reminders of God's perfect faithfulness. Where we would, as an exercise, a very beneficial exercise, take some trips down memory lane. Where we can be encouraged by the, words, uh, the Lord's work in our own lives. To return to our Mount Sinai's. To our burning bushes. We can see how despite our doubts, we can be encouraged. We can be, we can be uh, lifted up in knowing that God has proven faithful to his word. To be reminded of God's abiding presence in our lives. And in the life of the church today. To see how God has worked in us to examine how God has changed us, has matured us into Christ-likeness, grown our faith. And hopefully, we have experienced that in our own lives. Here, Moses is at the mountain, a changed man. And he highlights here that they are at the foot of the mountain in verse 2. You know, they're not wandering the deserts of Sinai, but this nation of recently redeemed slaves are encamped against the mountain. It has been very clearly three months since they have been delivered from Egypt, from its Riam, in verse 1. This will be where the children of Israel will spend the next year of their lives as a nation. As a matter of fact, the next 59 chapters of Torah are comprised of what takes place here at the foot of the mountain. The theophany of God, the manifestation of God, the giving of the law, the golden calf, the rewriting of the law by Moses' hand, the building of the tabernacle, the giving of the people that overwhelmed Moses. And then eventually the trumpet will sound and they will move on from here, but they will be at the foot of the mountain for a year before they carry on. It's a scene where Israel's national identity will be forged, where her spiritual destiny will be unveiled, and what her role will be on the larger world stage. Everything they have experienced from a personal perspective, from a personal individual perspective to a national one, the shared experiences of bondage and salvation are given their ultimate meaning here, and that is they are God's people a beloved nation of priests among the nations of the world, much in the same way that the church is today, that we are the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church and the bride of Christ. We all have a shared experience. We all have very different backgrounds, very different personal histories, different tastes, different interests, and I think that just glorifies God. But we all have this shared experience, an encounter with the living God. If you have not encountered the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I would just echo the words of the Apostle Paul, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't put it off. You don't know what tomorrow would bring. You don't even know what the next moment will bring. If you've not trusted in Christ, this is your moment. You have no excuse. You have no reason, no defense before the living God, because as you know, we preach the gospel at Glenridge. We preach Jesus Christ crucified for the sins of the world, for his people. We preach Christ as the one who died and gave up his life as a ransom for his people. We preach that Christ was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And we preach that Christ was raised from the dead, the great amen to the work of Calvary. That is all of us who have trusted in Christ, our common experience, our encounter with the risen Christ. For the children of Israel, it was their deliverance from Egypt. And now they are God's people. As I said, a beloved nation of priests among the nations of the world. For the children of Israel, it echoes the promise the Lord made to Abraham. I will make you a great nation. You will be a blessing to the families and to the nations of the world, Genesis 12. And so, as I said, Moses immediately makes his way up the mountain. The Hebrew inflection, as I've already shared with you, suggests that while the Israelites were pitching their tents, Moses was already halfway up the mountain, returning to where it all began. 
But it won't be the only time he goes up the mountain. It's not exactly clear how many times he goes up the mountain in the next 59 chapters. But we can confidently say that in verses 1 to 25, he travels up and down the mountain at least three times. The first time Moses goes up, the Lord reaffirms that their deliverance was by his hand. It is the foundation of the covenant. That when Moses returns to the foot of the mountain, he's going to remind the elders of Israel and through them to the 12 tribes of Israel that it was God who delivered them. And that is something that they cannot ever forget. From generation to generation, their salvation was always the work of the Lord. But that was simply the first phase of his redemptive plan for the nation. How the Lord delivered Israel like a swooping eagle. Beautiful terminology here, very poetic. The king of the birds, its outstretched wings, its ability to soar to great heights. There's something majestic about the eagle. Protectively carrying its young on its back, able to fly at considerable speeds over vast distances. It's really a description of the majestic power that God displayed in saving Israel from the house of bondage in Egypt. Carrying them off like fledglings who were unable to fly on their own. It says in Deuteronomy 32, 9 and 11, Deuteronomy really meaning second law, that is a recitation, a a repetition of the history of Israel and the law. Moses there in one of his uh, sermons reminds them, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob has allotted inheritance. In a desert land he found them. In a barren and howling waste he shielded them, cared for them. He has guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up the nest, hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on its pinions. Reminds us in the church today of how the Lord saved us as dead sinners, dead in our trespasses, unable to save ourselves. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. It was the Lord who saved us, the Lord who chose us, the Lord who plucked us out from this world, and it's the Lord who carries us through by his Holy Spirit. For the children of Israel, having carried them to to safety, a second phase is about to begin in the nation of Israel, one in which the Lord will reveal more of himself than at any other time in Torah, through a terrifying theophany and through his law. And how, as the Israelites remembered what God has done and had done in their lives, that salvific memory of their deliverance from Egypt should motivate them to obey the covenant laws he is about to deliver to them through his servant Moses. It is the principle of salvation, sanctification, and proclamation. Salvation, sanctification, and proclamation. That is the function of Israel in the Old Testament. That is the function of the church in the New. However, we must remind ourselves that the law was never meant as a means of salvation. Its function was never to save the children of Israel. They were already saved. They were delivered from Egypt. They were no no longer enslaved In Egypt, the children of Israel aren't going to be commanded to obey the laws of God in order to be saved. They were already redeemed. But the law they were about to receive was the next stage in their developing relationship with Yahweh. It will be a set of commandments based on an already freed people. And we have to remember the principle, the interpretational principle of chronology, time. They're already free. Now they are going to learn what it is to live in the presence of a holy God and in the context of that freedom. They are a chosen and established nation according to God's good pleasure in choosing them. Basically, in very simplistic terms, the law was an extension of their obligation to act worthy of their high calling as God's redeemed people, their sanctification. We would say now, Philippians 1 and 27, we would say now to the believer in Christ, walk worthy of the gospel. Not as a means of salvation, but as a representation of that salvation and the one who saved us. To live a life, the apostle Paul would say, worthy of the calling we have received, Ephesians 4 and 1. 
and that God will count us worthy of our calling, fulfilling every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in us, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 11. The law will lay out for God's ancient people how to live in holiness, which is supposed to be the hallmark of Israel's existence since they were, in verse 5, the royal property of God. And because he is Yahweh, because he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he is sovereign over all the heavens and the earth. He has, therefore, the divine prerogative to choose one nation, to choose one people to be a special treasure, and that people is Israel. That has not changed today. Israel is still his chosen people. Israel continues to be a royal property. And the amazing thing is they have done nothing to deserve it. The point of verse 5 to 6 is the principle that God has chosen a people to be separate from the rest of the world, uniquely in the Old Testament. That's reflected in the church in the New Testament age. They are a holy nation. They are set apart, beginning with their ancestor Abraham. And now the nation itself, here hundreds of years later, however many millions there are, they belong to the Lord. But they are not just simply a possession of the divine God. They were chosen with a purpose. Keep that in mind. They were chosen to be a, quote, kingdom of priests. There's your purpose, there's your sanctification, there's your proclamation. That's a term that is never used anywhere else in the entire Old Testament. Not just Torah, but the entire Old Testament. This is the only time This terminology is used of the nation of Israel. You see, not only was Israel chosen to be God's royal treasure, enjoying all the benefits of owning a national sovereignty, of being an independent people free from Egypt, they were also set apart for a very special, very specific function among all the other nations of the earth. They weren't delivered to now become a passive observer of history, and neither are we. The Apostle Paul condemns the Thessalonians with this sort of attitude, this spiritual attitude of kind of unfolding your umbrella chair and just kind of waiting for the Lord's return. He condemns that type of mindset quite harshly in the letter to the Thessalonians. We are to be about God's business. We are really, in a sense, to be the hands and feet, I'm sure you've heard that before, of Jesus ministering unto one another, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There is work to do. It's time the church rolls up her sleeves again and gets back to work. We are not to be passive observers of history, but to be actively involved in it, as Israel was. And God describes the manner in which he is going to use Israel to minister on an international scale. They weren't going to become isolationists. I say that because, and this is where my Hebrew classes are finally starting to pay off as I read the text. They were going to be God's nation, But the word that's used here in the Hebrew to describe Israel, goy, is not the traditional term that's used to describe Israel. It's always Yisrael. It's always by name, always a reference to Jacob, then to Isaac, and to Abraham. Yisrael. But here they are goy, the nation. That's reserved for the Gentile nations. That term, that word, goy, is... reserved for the Gentile nations, but here God is placing Israel as a nation, Goy, among the Goyim, the nations. There they will reveal the knowledge of the one true God to the world. That is the Lord's divine prerogative, to be the Goy amongst the Goyim. The church is part of the world. And the Lord's prayer for us was that we would not be taken out of the world, but that we would be protected while we are in the world. And we have a responsibility as the stewards of the gospel in our age to minister to a dead world, to be used by God according to his divine prerogative, to encourage, to edify, to build up the church individually, corporately here, one another, as a family. But then to take that wondrous news of Christ and what he has done and that shared experience, that salvific experience we've all shared 
on our individual roads to Damascus where we encountered the living, risen Christ, to now take that out to the world. What the world does with that message is their responsibility. There are outcomes. There are consequences for what they do with that. But we have been tasked in this age to go out, preach, and make disciples. The Israelites were no different. It would be their prerogative, their instruction to manifest the holiness of God, the one true God amongst all of the pagan gods and nations of the ancient world. They were going to do it as priests. Now, the only way to make sense of this terminology the Lord uses, since the Levitical, again, the, the, the idea, this, this, the chronology, the, the unfolding of the events, there are, there are no priests yet. There is no Levitical priesthood, we would say, where the tribe of Levi, where Aaron would be chosen and his descendants would exclusively minister at the tabernacle and eventually down the road to the temple. That hasn't been, that hasn't been set out yet in the law. So it's interesting the Lord uses the terminology that you are a nation of priests. Well, living in the ancient world, the Israelites knew very well what that meant. They knew how priests functioned in the pagan religions of their day. How they performed their duties, their, 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 their cultural roles and their responsibilities to their deities. And revealing their so-called knowledge of their gods to their followers. They had a working relationship. They, they saw it in Egypt. They saw it in the surrounding nations. The role and the function of a priest. God is going to redeem that role and give it divine significance and meaning at the tabernacle. But first, nationally, Israel is going to do that. Israel is different. Israel is a holy and priestly nation that God has chosen to reveal himself through and through which he will fulfill his salvific plans that were set in motion during the fall of our first parents in the garden sanctuary, in the garden of Eden. Well, how does that, what does that mean for us? Well, the church functions in, in very much the same way today. The apostle Peter wrote that the church is using Torah terminology He's using this terminology of a nation of priests in his epistle, divinely led by God's spirit to write this. To the church, he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priest. He's speaking about us. The Holy Spirit is describing the church in the first century and the church today. So listen closely because these words are for all of us here who believe. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A people belonging to God. 1 Peter 2 and 9. That's how the Holy Spirit describes us, sees us, and expects us to function in this world. As I said, using that Torah terminology, Peter describes how the newly formed church in the first century should see themselves. We're not the well and gun club, we're not the rotary club. We're not the old Flintstones water buffaloes. We're, we're none of those things. We're not a club. We are the church. We have been called out by God for salvation, sanctification, and proclamation. And that's how the church needs to see herself today. Unfortunately, it does not. The church wants to be liked. The church wants to be accepted culturally. We want to be tolerant. We want to be inclusive. And all these other buzzwords we hear flying around today. Jesus was not inclusive. Jesus was not tolerant. The Lord Jesus was very stern in his rebuke of sin and sinful lifestyles. But he was gracious in that he offered a means of salvation. He offered a means of forgiveness. But he was very clear. There is a line in the sand, and the church has constantly retreated from that line of holiness, of sanctification. I'm not talking about perfection. I am one of the most imperfect, I am the most imperfect person I know. And if you're honest, you look in the mirror and you come to the exact same conclusion. But God, be, please be patient, as we, God is still working on me. But I'm still called to live a holy life. 
I'm still called to go back to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and remember what he did for me there, for the church there, for his people there. I'm reminded of the sanctification process to be holy as I am holy and that I am to proclaim and to go out and preach the message of Christ both through my actions and my attitudes but most importantly through my words. Just as Israel was chosen, the idea is now that the church through the risen Christ is now also, we are also now God's people. We have not replaced Israel. I do not subscribe to replacement theology. We have not replaced Israel. We are just another phase in the plan of God's redemptive work. But we are now God's people. Christ is the embodiment and the fulfillment, really, of Exodus 19 of all. Scripture. He is the treasured possession of God the Father. He is the great high priest. He is the head of a holy nation. He is the light of revelation to the Gentiles, Luke 2 and 32. And those of us who have believed and trusted him are in Christ. And all of us who belong to him through faith should expect to also be used by him for unique and special purpose. The pattern that is clearly described and formed here within the national identity of Israel, that's continued in the identity, the spiritual identity of the church in the New Testament. The idea isn't a new one. You know, oftentimes we say that in the Old Testament, Christ is concealed. And you know it, in the New Testament, he is revealed. So a lot of the ideas, a lot of the principles of the Old Testament continue into the New. Throughout the ages, the Lord has chosen representatives. Noah, during his day and age. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Israel, and now the Ecclesia, the church. So we are saved from our sins, but we are also delivered for the benefits of those around us. Have you ever thought of that? That was one of those moments that just took me my, just, it was like just one of those moments where I just, it was like an epiphany. We are saved from our sins to the glory of God, but we're also delivered for the benefits of those around us. How will they know the gospel? How will they hear if there's no one to preach? Abraham was chosen to be a blessing to the nation in fulfillment of the promise of Genesis 3 and 15, of a coming seed, a coming redeemer who would destroy the works of Satan. Israel was delivered to be a blessing to the nations by revealing the Lord and his holiness as the one true God of heaven and earth. We are saved in order that the Lord may be glorified by the work he has begun and will complete in each one of us who have believed and the word he has called us to do. Go out into the world, as I said. Make disciples. We do that by living holy lives, preaching the gospel. And just like Israel, when the law was given, its intention was for Israel to live lives of impeccable behavior. Live with a reverent fear of the Lord. To live a holy, that is, set-apart life. The contrast is striking today between the chosen, the true, holy church of God. Godly people in the world. The tolerance, the celebration, the advocacy of sin. And the holiness we are called for. The light is shining brighter because the world is getting darker. And so we live with a reverent fear of the Lord, living in holiness because he is holy. You know, it's one of the primary reasons in verses 10 to 15, God instructs Moses to prepare the Israelites for that theophany, to prepare them for the holy presence of the living God was about to descend upon the mountain. And naturally, with all those environmental disturbances that accompanied this magnificent theophany, the people, verse 16, they were terrified. One of the amazing things about us in the church today that I've trusted in the Lord Jesus is that we both fear God, and yet I don't fear God. Now listen closely. We both fear God and don't fear God. Now what do I mean by that? Naturally, when we consider the power of God, even in our limited understanding of him and his revelation of who he is, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence, that is he's everywhere at once, knows everything, is all powerful. We should be overcome, we should be terrified, we should be paralyzed and tremble with fear 
considering by the word of his mouth, the cosmos was created. I can barely put together a 500-piece puzzle. But God has the divine power to hang the stars in the sky as easily as we walk and breathe. That's the only proper response when we consider the person of Yahweh, of the Lord. But now, any fear we might have had in our righteous standing before him, well, that's been dealt with. I can stand before God. I have nothing to fear because I do not stand alone. I have an advocate. I have a mediator. I have one who stands in my place, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. I am covered in his blood, spiritually speaking, and when the Lord sees, the Lord God, the Father sees me, he sees his Son, his righteousness imputed to me. So in that sense, though I tremble at the person and the power of God, I do not fear standing in his presence because I have Jesus. What Jesus accomplished on the cross in an empty tomb, we don't have to fear our standing before the Holy One of Israel. And so as we live holy lives before the Lord, that separateness that Israel was chosen to be a distinct mark, that should be a distinct mark of the church today. Christ describes us in Matthew 5, 13 to 16 as, does anyone know what he says there in Matthew 5, 13 to 16? He describes us as two things. Salt light. And even though we're not subject to the law the way the Israelites were, and since Christ came to fulfill the law, it doesn't mean that we don't have moral obligations or responsibilities. We still have a relationship with the law. We still have moral obligations. We still have responsibilities. But never as a means of salvation. The epistles are full of instructions, full of commandments for holy living and how we're supposed to live in the light of our Savior's resurrection. And the amazing thing about the New Testament, it never shies away from giving us strong moral reminders on how to live these redeemed lives as Christ's kingdom on the church. And again, not so that we can be saved by what we do or that we can somehow remain saved by doing them because some people fall into that trap that we have to remain in those things to say, stay saved, but that it is in fact a reflection of our heavenly citizenship, that we're wholly separated from the world with a different nature, a different character, a different outlook, a different worldview, a different destiny. As a holy nation of priests among the nations of the world, a people have been raised up in a newness of life in Christ. And that usually takes place in day-to-day -day situations that may not seem so important to us. That's where we can really be used as a light, where we can really function as salt, no matter the circumstances. When we are being holy and separate, eventually someone is gonna notice. It's amazing that when I'm at the gym, and this just happened to me yesterday, when I was at the gym in the morning, someone looked at me and used some terminology that I won't describe here, but he said, you're built like a you-know-what brick house. And I don't see myself that way. And he goes on and on, and he's talking about all these different things of the past and this and that and the other thing, and, and he's using a lot of colorful language that we hear out in the world today and I only step in if somebody takes the Lord's name in vain, but if you want to use all these other derogatory terms, that's fine, that's, that's your terminology, that's your vernacular, I'm not going to get involved in that. But then he stops and he says, so what do you do? <laughs> it's always like, you're a policeman, a bouncer, what, oh, so I look at him and I said, well, you're probably not going to believe me. But since I am called to tell the truth, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and his face says, oh. But the conversation led itself to him commenting on the fact that he noticed I never swear. Because guys use language. You know, this, this is part of the world today. It's totally acceptable. And I noticed that when someone takes Jesus' name, 
in vain. You seem to say something. You pipe up. He noticed. To the glory of God, he noticed. So be encouraged that when you live holy lives, these people who stand before us are going to be forced to look into the face of God through his children. They're going to see the God who saved us, who is transforming us into the image of the Son. That's what the world, that's what the nations of Israel's day saw in them. The God that they represented, the God that they worshipped. It's the same for us today. So here we are. Moses' life has come full circle. Once the child of a slave turned adopted son of Pharaoh to exile, to outcast, to leader of Israel, he's back on the mountain. And God is about to reveal himself in a way that he has never done before. And Lord willing, we'll see that next week through a theophany and the giving of his law. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for these few moments that we can just take a look back in time and to see how you prepared the nation of Israel for what they would become. The call to holiness, the revelation of your holiness, the revelation of your power, your person upon the mountaintop. We're reminded that all of these things anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded just how small we are, how sinful we are, how wretched we are in the sight of the living holy God, enthroned on high. We thank you that we can have these moments of insight to look back, not only to the holy mountain, but to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ on another mountain, on Mount Calvary, where we celebrate, where we rejoice that our salvation was purchased at such a cost. And in light of that, in the memory of that, in the truth of that, Father, help us to live by the power of your Spirit, holy lives. And we do cry out. We cry out and pray that you would forgive us where we have fallen, where we have brought shame to your name by the way we have behaved, by the words we have said. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for the sake of Jesus and help us, equip us in these days to shine all the brighter as salt and light, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen people that belong to you, and we thank you that we belong to you through Jesus Christ. We do pray all of this and that everything was pleasing to you. In the Lord Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is a hymn of response to the message and the wonderful reality of serving the God that we serve. It's 103 in our hymn book, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. If you're able, I'd ask you to stand and let's sing this as our closing hymn. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord.
challenge for you this week. When someone asks you who you are or what you do, now Dave can say he was, you know, I'm a pastor. You can say that. You guys can't pull that off yet. I really encourage you to take some pastoral studies. But I challenge you when someone asks you that, answer them. Well, I'm a royal priest. I'm a chosen people. I'm a people of God. I'm a disciple of Christ. Answer them and see what happens. And get back to me. I'd, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see if anyone does that and what the response is. I love when I tell people I'm a pastor because usually the face is, oh. But I tell them, you know, more importantly, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus. And we should all do that. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you again for this morning, this Lord's Day. We thank you for the, uh, the blessing to be together, to worship together, Lord. We thank you for everyone that is involved with the ministry of Glen Ridge Bible Church, and we pray that it's to your honor and to your glory and that the name of the Lord Jesus would continue to be preached faithfully here amongst all of us who call Glen Ridge home. I want to pray for those who are hurting, those who are suffering, those who are underemployed or unemployed, those who are going through financial difficulties or whatever their situation might be. Lord, I pray you would be merciful and minister to their needs in this day. Father, I just pray and just again look to you now to take us home in peace, and if it be your will to gather together again tonight. Enjoy a time of fellowship and friendship with one another as the family of God here at Glenridge. So, Father, I pray you take us in peace. I pray that your face would shine upon us. We would sense your abiding presence in all the different areas of our life. And, Father, help us, equip us, give us courage and strength to answer people's questions about who we are, that we are the people of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock, soup, stew, and chili night.